Hello, I'm Dr. Louise Newson. I'm a GP and menopause specialist, and I'm also the founder of the Newson Health Menopause and Wellbeing Centre here in Stratford upon Avon. I'm also the founder of the Free Balance app. Each week on my podcast, join me and my special guests where we discuss all things perimenopause and menopause. We talk about the latest research, bust myths on menopause symptoms and treatments, and often share moving and always inspirational personal stories. This podcast is brought to you by the Newson Health Group, which has clinics across the UK dedicated to providing individualised perimenopause and menopause care for all women. I've got someone who actually I've respected for many years since I read a novel that she wrote called Chocolat a um, long time ago and it really resonated with me, a very powerful, beautiful actual novel. So the author, Joanne Harris, is now in front of me, so I'm fangirling her actually, which she doesn't realise. <laughs> so, so thanks ever so much for coming to talk today, Joanne. It's a pleasure to be here, thank you. Ah, oh, so, so your publisher's got in touch with me and you've written this book, which is now out, called Broken Light. Um, amazing book. I finished it last night, actually, and I used to read a lot, but now all I seem to do is, is work and don't have as much time to read, which is one of my biggest regrets. So actually, I had to read this book and I had to finish it by today. And it was great because last night I sat on the sofa and I was just in my own world. And how wonderful was that? So I'm very grateful that you've given me some time to rekindle my uh, joy of reading. So tell me about the book, Joanne. Well, it's a book about um, growing older and feeling invisible and women's rage, actually. It's a bit of a metaphor. And it's, uh, there is a nod in there to Stephen King's Carrie because Carrie, of course, achieves her supernatural awakening at puberty and my heroine, Bernie Moon, finds mm-hmm. her supernatural powers at menopause instead. And so the whole mm-hmm. thing is a kind of metaphor for menopause and anger and, and women in later life who don't normally get to be the protagonists of novels that often. Mm. It's very unusual to read a book where you've got Bernie's experience weaved throughout so many pages. Sometimes menopause is mentioned in a odd little few sentences or a few pages in a book, but it's quite unusual, isn't it, to have a book where you can really get a sense of the, the suffering and the emotions as well, so the psychological symptoms that are going on, not just the physical symptoms. Yes, I, I wanted to do that because it's actually it, it's a topic that needs to be demystified, and it's really not mentioned very often in fiction. It tends to be thought of as just a bit disgusting and not mm-hmm. something that people want to read about. Turns out that actually from my readers, people do want to read about it. Yes. And there's been this kind of overwhelming surge of gratitude from some of my early readers saying, oh, thank God, somebody's actually told it the way it is. Yes, and that's so important. You know, 98% of people we see in my clinic have psychological symptoms. We're told for many years that the menopause is hot flushes. It's Hmm. night sweats. It might be a bit of vaginal dryness. But no one really teaches us the importance of hormones in our brain. Hmm. Not just oestrogen, but testosterone as well. And it's often, for many of us, myself included, if you don't have those hormones, you have no idea how much they were working in your brain. And so this anxiety, this this reduced self-esteem, the sort of rumination, the uh, overthinking of things can be very common. It is, absolutely. I can completely relate. And I mean, it's, it's strange because as with chocolate, I've learned a lot more about the topic of my book as I was writing my book than I knew mm. before writing the book. Um, you know, when I passed through menopause, I just, I was in a complete haze of ignorance about everything. I, I didn't have any resources. My GP just said, oh, let nature take its course. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, w- I was left thinking, A, that I was going crazy, B, that I was probably making too much of something that, you know, all women have, and why was I making a fuss about it? And, and just I just thought eventually, you know, this is it. This is the new normal. This is me. Mm. I'm beginning now to understand that that's not necessarily true. But a lot mm. of Bernie's experiences, that the feeling that she is going crazy, the physical symptoms, but also the sense that she is just disappearing. 
from the world. Mm. That is, is absolutely, you know, what I felt and what to a certain extent I still feel. And that happens so much. You know, when I opened my clinic, I really wanted to just work. It sounds a bit crazy when I work so hard now, but I wanted to just work one day a week and just see some of my friends who'd been given antidepressants for their menopause and get to help some of the mums from school. And then I developed a website, which was then called Menopause Doctor. Um, it's now called balance-menopause.com. But um, I started to write about what the menopause is, what it means, what the hormones do in our body. And then I started to see people from many miles away, and this was before COVID, so we couldn't do Zoom consultations. But I remember a patient I saw, and she'd come down from Edinburgh, so she'd actually got um, a train, she'd got a, a, a bus, then she'd got a taxi, and she'd stayed overnight the night before. And she was 42, and she mm. told me the last 10 years she'd really struggled, but she'd given up her job, her partner had left her, she was a shell of her formal self, and she'd put on weight, she couldn't think about anything, she couldn't remember things, she used to be an accountant and just had stopped working. And I said, what happened to you when your symptoms started? She said, oh, it's very obvious, I know what happened. She said, I had my ovaries removed, I had some endometriosis, they said, you're a lot better without your ovaries and your womb and we'll remove the endometriosis, so it's a very successful operation. I said, yes, but they removed your ovaries, that made you menopausal, did it? She said, well, no one told me. I said, did anyone talk to you about having your hormones replaced because you're so young it's really important for your future health she said no no one's told me at all they said I should be grateful because my endometriosis is gone oh, and I yeah. remember feeling very sad after this consultation and my husband's a urologist and I went home and I said to him Paul if if you were taking someone's testes off because maybe they had um, you know cancer or something you took both their testes off which would mean they wouldn't have testosterone in their bodies would they leave hospital without any hormones he went, don't be ridiculous, Louise. Think of that <laughs> suffering to that man. And then he started laughing and realised exactly why I was asking him. And I said, but it happens all the time. This was seven years ago, and uh, one of our research fellows has just done an audit at his hospital. He's a gynaecologist looking at the percentage of women who are young, who have ovaries removed, who are given HRT. Mm. There are some women who are given HRT, but the dose is incredibly low, and they're not given testosterone, they're only given oestrogen. And testosterone we produce in higher quantities than oestrogen before the menopause when we're young. So why is it that men are allowed something and women can't? It just doesn't seem right, does it? It really doesn't. And yet we've been living with this pretty much, you know, forever. It is mm. it is thought to be woman business and men are not yes. involved in woman business. Even male GPs don't seem yes. all of them to, to feel comfortable talking about woman business. And so you're left to deal with it alone. Um, yes. I, I uh, spoke about this slightly to my mother who came out with a spiel about how ridiculous young women were making nothing out of things that were com completely normal and how she just powered through it in her day and that, you know, I would be able to do the same. And I thought, OK, that's it. You know, we, mm. we power through. But it's actually, you know, we don't have to. No, and I think this whole narrative that women have to suffer yes. seems really sad. You know, I, it's in, very biblical. Old, yes, it is biblical. <laughs> and in the old days, you know, um, periods were cursed, weren't they? Of Have course. you got your curse? Well, and, and, then, and then now it was the change. Well, what are we changing into? We're changing into something that is a shadow of our formal selves for a lot of people. Some people feel very invigorated without their hormones, but they are the minority. We know that many people have symptoms, and in fact, one of the pieces of research I'm presenting next week is a survey of nearly 6,000 women looking at unex unexpected symptoms of the menopause, and muscle and joint pains, dry eyes, very common, um, this itchiness of the skin, some of the mental health issues, people weren't expecting at all. Tinnitus, again, is a very common oh, symptom. Yeah, that too. Restless legs, poor sleep. Okay, all um, of this is sounding very, very familiar to me. <laughs> so, there's a, I mean, we, we came up with 99 symptoms. If you look on, on um, websites, some people will say there's 87, there's 23, there's 64 symptoms. Actually, there's hundreds of symptoms because our hormones go all over our bodies. Yet women, I know from just looking at my social media, listening to women, is that they'll go to a healthcare professional and they'll say, no, it can't be your hormones because you haven't got hot flushes or because you're not this certain age or you're not this certain. And actually, no, of course, I know all the time when I, I learn from patients, when they have symptoms, I often say, I have no idea if it's related to your hormones, but I'll give you your hormones back because we know there's 
health benefits of your hormones and see what's left. And then when they come back and say, my tinnitus is gone, my itchy skin's gone, my uh, sense of smell has come back, my, my mouth is less dry. Well, of course, then it's going to be related to their hormones. There's a lot of common sense out there. And a lot of women are just being uh, silenced, actually, because they're saying, no, it can't be. Don't be silly. Like you say, just put up with it. It will, you know... Um, Maybe it's because you're not exercising or you're not mm. doing the right, um, eating the right food or whatever. Yeah. We're being blamed, actually, for something yes, yes, that we are. is out of our control. We are. We are. We're blamed. We're, it's like, oh, you didn't do this. You didn't eat a healthy enough diet. You didn't mm. relax enough. You, you, you know, you, you should be doing this. It's that the onus is on women to change even more rather mm. than to actually face the changes that their body is undergoing and to accept them and to look at them. Yes, and that's part of such a bigger conversation globally as well. You know, my mission is to improve the global health of women. You know, obviously I'm starting in the UK, but a lot of the reach up with, with balance and, and the other work I do is, is reaching women and resonating to women globally. Mm. But I've recently been to Morocco just um, for family holiday and we were in Marrakesh and we almost played a game with my teenage children. Let's spot the women. What are the women doing? Where are they working? What are they? They're all hiding. Not they're all, of course, not all. But there's a significant number, and certain countries they're still hiding because they become more invisible as they age. Sometimes they have other commitments, of course, at home. But knowing how the menopause affects people, it can affect people in other cultures and other ethnicities, of course, as well. So mm. you're you're made to feel almost you should be concentrating just on your home and your family you shouldn't have that confidence you can't think your concentration maybe is not so good your ability to multitask isn't so good your ability to be a working woman we know lots of women around 10 percent give up their jobs because of the menopause yeah but actually there's something about that that doesn't seem a problem um and i don't know why other well, than I it's think, women I, th I think the thing is there is a very strong underlying narrative that when you reach menopause you are used up and you are no mm. longer of any worth. And so trying to help somebody who is not perceived by a patriarchal society as being mm. worthwhile seems to be a bit of a waste of time to that patriarchal society because there are lots of women who are still worthwhile and mm. they concentrate their energies on them. And I don't think it's anything as conscious as that, but it certainly feels that way. I mean, yes, when you look at does. the invisibility of women in the media beyond a certain age and mm. in the arts and in the acting professions and, you know, why would you look at a woman who is over 50 when you could be looking at a 30-year-old instead? And that's really mm. the, the question that they're asking and there is no, no real answer. No, but you could look at 50-year-old men and oh, yeah. they keep going, don't oh, yeah, they? Well, men, men, men are different. Men, men have a different visibility and men don't lose that visibility. They are not, they are not thought of as being used up um, mm. because they're not yeah. seen to be primarily important because of their sexual viability during their lifetime anyway, whereas women are. It doesn't matter how successful you are as a woman. You know, look on social media at the way women are treated and the way women are spoken of. And the mm. first thing that most people notice is whether they're pretty, whether they're attractive, whether they're sexually viable. Mm. And so, you know, it, it doesn't matter how far you go in your profession. You can be a great athlete, but if you're not rateable to the majority of men, then that's the thing that they will focus on. And it hasn't changed. You'd think... Over the years, you know, we're now 2023, I've got three daughters who are vehemently strong and quite feminist, but actually things aren't easy. My 20-year-old's my a musician, she's a trombonist, and most brass players are men, and mm -hmm. she's breaking a bit of a mould. I get a lot of bullying and toxicity from all sorts of people for the work that I do, yes, and I I've imagine. often said, wouldn't it be great if I was a man? Because yeah. <laughs> I think I'd be treated like a, like a hero. If yes, they would. They, they would. Women. They would take you as primarily a doctor rather than a woman. Mm. Yeah, a woman doctor is is a slightly different thing. When when mm. people are asked to visualize a doctor, most people will visualize a man. Um, mm. And in the same way, there is a difference between a novelist and a lady novelist. And yes. you know, the lady novelist is not perceived to be as good. 
somehow I mean, because men speak for universal experience and, and women yes. speak for a women's experience, which is very unfair and also very untrue. But I also, it's not just men actually, some women can be really quite toxic and certainly in medicine, there's a hierarchy of medicines. So my husband is a surgeon, so he's obviously very important. <laughs> um, and even in hospital medicine, there's a big debate now with gynaecologists who do a lot of menopause work. Mm. But actually, my pushback is I think GPs should be doing the most, but not even just GPs, it should be nurses and pharmacists. And we have a lot of nurses and pharmacists that work with me in the clinic. Um, but I, we had a letter yesterday, actually, from a lady who'd... Um, uh, she'd, seen a, she'd seen a doctor, a gynaecologist, and she'd had cancer of the womb a very early stage many years ago. And she'd gone back just for a routine check to a gynaecologist. But she was also one of our patients and taking HRT. And the, the, the uh, gynaecologist had written to say, I forbid you to take HRT. You shouldn't take it. And you shouldn't be seeing these GP menopause experts. I want you to see a consultant NHS gynaecologist who's a menopause expert. Mm. And I have a real battle in that with my, my, in my mind because... I've got a pathology science degree, a first-class pathology degree. I'm a member of the Royal College of Physicians. I was a hospital doctor for many years. And then I changed into general practice. I'm a fellow of the Royal College of GPs. And I'm a menopause specialist as well. So I think I've got more letters after my name than most gynaecologists. You'd and think, wouldn't you? I know more. So why, why is it that a doctor or a hospital specialist can know more than me I'm very happy to think that they can operate better than me. I can't, you know, suit them, but I never pretended I am. Mm -hmm. But it's this whole inequality that goes on all the time. And it, I mean, it's the same in any work, isn't it? This sort of hierarchy of self entitlement. And, you know, my issue with a lot of it is that women are getting in the middle of all of this and then they don't know who to believe. Yes. That, well, who's she? She's got a fancy private clinic. We can't believe her because she sits on telly and talks on this morning. Mm -hmm. But actually, they don't see all the other work that's done and the huge amounts of papers and academic um, uh, papers that I've read and, and contributed to. And it, it's, it's really quite nasty, actually, when it's women going against women as well. Yes. And then, you know, I, I don't quite see where people want to gain from this as well, really. Oh, I, I just don't think they, they understand quite what they're, they're buying into. I think, you know, uh, there are a lot of women with a lot of internalised self-hatred and misogyny mm. and fear, mostly mm. fear, that actually they have more power than they think they have. And yes. that's something that sometimes is a bit frightening and needs to be explored. Actually, this is what my book is all about, the, the fear yes. of women's own power and, yes. and how we retreat into our little boxes and we don't examine the actual influence that we have over the world and other people because it's scary, because the repercussions are scary of having power and exercising it. And sometimes it's better just to do what, what the patriarchy tells you. Yes, in short term it is, obviously in the bigger picture it isn't, but I felt that with Bernie in the book. I felt really sorry for her. I wanted to get her into my clinic and help her. I wanted <laughs> to talk to her. And, you know, lots of people we see in the clinic, even before we talk about treatment, they just thank us for time. They thank us for giving an explanation, for knowing there's a reason for their symptoms and a reason for some symptoms that they don't even realise are related to their hormones. But it's that understanding that they've perhaps not had from other people and I think even with Bernie she needed somebody to just take her to one side and say this is what's happening these are your choices for you you don't have to be feeling like this and, she absolutely you know, did yes she should have met mm, you really <laughs> yes so um so but the way you write is just so beautiful and I, I do want to ask you about chocolate because I don't actually eat chocolate because I have my no I don't eat that much of it either <laughs> astonishingly but, but when I read the book, and I could still almost taste the chocolate when I even see the cover of your book, and it's not a particularly long book, is it? But it's no, it, not especially. Were you, were you surprised that the reviews that it had, it went into a film, which obviously the film was brilliant, but not as good as the book. The books are always better, aren't they? But, but it's that um, the, the response that it had from people was quite something, wasn't it? Did, did that surprise you at the uh, time? I was incredibly surprised because I'd been told that if I wrote things like that, they wouldn't sell. <laughs> Oh, really? and that they weren't fashionable and I just Gosh. ended up writing I've always written what I wanted to write at any mm. given time and that happened to be what I wanted to write and I was lucky enough for it to be I think different enough from what was fashionable and what was expected mm. 
to attract mm. somebody's attention. And then it became a word of mouth success. But I wasn't, yes. no, I wasn't thinking about it at all. I just thought, hey, what if I wrote a book that was a kind of metaphor for tolerance? Mm. Mm. And it, I'm, I'm quite keen on the idea of using magic or mm. some kind of supernatural um, power as a metaphor for something else. So actually, you know, mm. Broken Light and Chocolat are not a million miles apart in that respect because both of them have a central metaphor which is about women's magic, women's power mm, yes. and, and how it's expressed. Unfortunately, poor Bernie's power is not expressed through chocolate and doesn't generally bring yeah. people joy or, or even bring her joy. But mm. that's really how it works. That she has this, this inner fire which comes out in these hot flushes or flashes as I call them because I want yes. to make the distinction between the symptom and what she is actually experiencing mm. which is much more of a, a neurological process and possibly also a paranormal process but yeah I mean I, I just mm. I just love writing about that that sort of thing and the way different people perceive their world mm. and it's, it's very interesting because this book obviously talks a lot about the menopause. I've brought a book out recently um, called The Definitive Guide to the Perimenopause and Menopause, and it's it's got into the number 10 Sunday Times books. But I was talking down in Waterstones at Piccadilly two nights ago for, at an event, sold-out event, and they had some books left over, so they said, can you sign them? And I said, yes, of course. I said, where are the books going? Oh, they were going up on the third floor. I said, right, it's a Sunday Times bestseller, is it not going on a table at the front of the shop? I've come all the way down to London to do this. For, mm, I have to talk to the manager. And I know it won't be. It will be down in health and well-being under pregnancy books in the corner. And, and something that affects 51% of the population, I think, deserves to be on a table. It really does, yes, it does. And I've said to the publishers, can it go into Tesco's and Asda and Sainsbury's and the supermarkets? Oh, no, they're not keen on that. They like, they like diet books. They like cooking mm. books. So it's I'm because it's, it's not seen as an upbeat topic. It's seen as yeah. a bit of a downer and people don't want mm. to think about it because, you know, it, it depresses them and frightens them to think about it. But actually, those are the things we should be demystifying. And they, they are the things, they're the conversations we should be having because all these, these diet books and these other self-help books are seen to be hopeful. But actually, this mm. too is self-help. And, Absolutely. you know, people are living longer and longer nowadays. You know, you, mm. you can expect to live another 30 odd years after you hit menopause. You know, you want to be yeah. happy during that time. And, you want to be healthy. Absolutely. And so one of my research interests is um, inflammaging and longevity. So we know that hormones are very anti-inflammatory in our body. And so we know that women who take hormones have a lower risk of diseases. And it's not about the age that we die. It's the journey to get yeah. to that age. Yeah. And it's about being as healthy as we can because... Also, none of us want to go to doctors. None of us want to be ill, of course. But I'm very scared of osteoporosis, and I'm also quite scared of dementia. I've, I've doctored enough people in nursing homes and um, who have both osteoporosis and dementia. And, um, you know, ways of reducing risk of disease are really important. So it shouldn't be seen... When you talk to men about menopause, people think, oh, it's just women who are a bit annoying. and they're Women a bit moaning. And, yeah, women, it's totally old women is. moaning, basically. That's what they think yes. it's going to be. Yes. But you also think it's actually women who aren't having sex. That's quite a big thing. Yeah. And women who aren't putting back into the economy because they're giving up their jobs or not going for promotion or going working part time. So that's the only way I think people are thinking about it. But I think so, too. And there's also a kind of disgust. Mm. in women's bodies and what they do. Yes. Disgust based on ignorance, and this is a disgust that goes to old women and fat women and women with mm. different bodies. Mm. And, you know, we don't want to see them, apparently, and we don't want to talk about them. Well, you know, no. it's it's time yes. we, we changed that. Absolutely. I mean, we've just funded a surgeon in Uganda to complete her training, and she does a lot of work um, for women who've had fistulas in pregnancy. And um, obviously, when you've got scarring in your perineum, when you become menopausal, the tissues can become very thin and fragile. And a lot of these women have urinary incontinence. If you have urinary incontinence in some places in Africa, that you can't go to church, you can't 
um, have a relationship, you can't have a job. Mm -hmm. And my husband's a urologist, he does charity work in Africa, he's just come back from Milawi, and he does amazing um, reconstructive surgery that means that these men don't have to have catheters. Mm -hmm. And it's incredible because then they can get back to work and everything else. He went with some women, uh, female surgeons, who were looking at the scoping for helping females and with surgery. And I said, why don't they just have some hormones? If they had some hormones vaginally, it would really help urinary symptoms without the need of surgery for many women. Oh, I can't do that. It's too expensive. can't do it. But it's dirt cheap over here. And it's, it would be transformational for these women, but they can still hide. It doesn't matter if they don't have jobs in the same way that for men. And it's, um, this is where I'm talking about a global problem that it, women aren't listened to it doesn't it's like it's well it's just one of those things isn't it and yeah. then if, you know their life expectancy isn't as high as over here so yeah. does it matter that they have urinary symptoms for less time and of course it does no one should have <laughs> yes, symptoms for a day in my mind <laughs> yeah. yeah so there's a, a lot we need to change I mean how do you see the future I mean do you see that women are listened to more? Do you think they're becoming less invisible or more invisible, Joanne? Well, it depends on which women. I think both of us are white women with a platform and we have voices which are likely to be heard more than if we weren't. But I think it's important for us to understand that when we see progress, we generally see progress for ourselves, but we also have to look mm. to see if other women are also making progress. So it's interesting that you're talking about women in Uganda because very clearly there isn't a lot of progress being made for them. And we have to see this as a, a women's problem, not just a, a mm. you and me problem. So I, I'm, mm. I'm hopeful because we're having this conversation mm. and I don't think that 20 years ago we would have been. I'm also hopeful because other high-profile women in the media and in the arts are also talking about mm. this and I'm hopeful because a big movement like Me Too has empowered women to use their voices at a time when I think some of them thought that they didn't have voices and that too is important mm. but I think any progress is slow. Any progress always gets an incredible amount of pushback which is why high profile women like you and me are constantly getting abuse in the media and getting mm. knocked down and being told to shut up because actually that comes from a place of fear and mm. we just have to this is something we have to power through actually it's not uh, it's not something we can just back away from but i'm i'm hopeful but i don't expect to see change immediately because unfortunately change does take such a long time and we also have to get people who are not experiencing this to to understand that it's also partly their problem Yes, and that is a harder conversation to have. It is, but I think we're getting there. I feel I take two steps forward and one and a half back, and there are yeah. many days that I just want to run away and stop, and then my husband says, no, Louise, come on, don't do it. Think of these, these stories that you hear, the people that you've helped. Absolutely, um, but yes, it's very frustrating, very yeah. exhausting, and, and thank you so much for the work you do because it's really important. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you for writing this novel. And I hope that it is going to be in, in front tables in bookshops and not tucked away. Um, and it will hope, hopefully just generate just a bit more thought. I think there's a lot of pre professional curiosity that's gone in the menopause. And we need to get this curiosity back, not just for healthcare professionals, but for women, for men. And the more they read in unexpected places including your wonderful novel it's going to really help um so I'm, I'm really excited and i wish you every luck with the launch and thank you um, before we go though i'm going to put you on the spot because i always ask for three take-home tips on the podcast oh, okay so i want to ask you three reasons why i should recommend that others should read your book one okay because it is not just a women's experience it is a universal experience the way women feel shape our world, or should, and they shouldn't be ignored. Two, because you are a woman, and because at some point it will be your experience. Three, because you are a man, and it's also going to be your experience at some point, and you need to know more about your world, and you need to have more curiosity, and I can give you a fourth too, because it's jolly good fun. Oh, good, yes. Yeah, that, I like the fourth. We'll keep that one in That's okay. So, oh, brilliant. I've really enjoyed talking to you today and I'm very grateful for your time. So oh, thanks thank for being you. a guest today. Thank, thank you. you so much for inviting me.
You can find out more about Newson Health Group by visiting www.newsonhealth.co.uk and you can download the free Balance app on the App Store or Google Play.